Hello and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and we're glad you could join us for another hour of answering your gardening questions. If you'd like to get in touch with us, simply dial 1-800-676-5446. Our phone volunteers will be glad to help you. If you've got pictures or you want to send us an email, that address is byf at unl.edu. Please tell us where you live and as much as you can about your particular issue. And remember that's for a future show. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook. Check out our video features on the Backyard Farmer YouTube channel. So we're gonna get started with some samples and Jody, you are hoping your sample behaves. My sample is not behaving, but I brought an Eastern Eye Click Beetle. Hopefully I can just hold my self study here and it stays on there. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so Eastern Eye Click Beetle, you can see it's got the false eye spots here. It's kind of playing dead right now, but the false eye spots scare away predators. And these are found anytime this spring and summer, and there's nothing to worry about. The eggs are laid in the soil, the larvae develop in decaying wood, and actually feed on the grubs of wood boring beetles. So they're actually beneficial and quite predaceous. And then as adults, uh, I've just been sharing a piece of apple every day with, uh, with this beetle. And I just wanna thank the clients who dropped this off to have it identified, but then took it back to show their grandkids and then brought it back so I could take it on TV, so. <laughs> Love it, and they are fun. They're really weird and fun. Yeah, they do this clicking thing so right. that they can go from being on their back to their front, and then they also scare away predators. Of course. So. All right, John, your debut, and you brought basically a salad of plantain. <laughs> they could be interpreted that way, I think. Uh, these are plantains, and they're kind of neat because they have prominent seed heads. And this one is called broadleaf plantain, and it's sort of a you know basal rosette of leaves, sort of elliptical oval leaves with strong veins. And I really like the seed heads. It's kind of a rat tail seed head and um, kind of average fibrous root system, this one. Uh, and then on this side, we have buckhorn plantain, which is very similar. Uh, again, the seed heads are held up high. The seed heads are different though. They're, they're rat tail, but they're shorter, not quite as long. And the leaves are all uh, lanceolate was the term that I read that they were used. Very very uh, long and skinny, but with strong veins as well. And you tend to see the buckhorn a little bit more in pastures, road ditches, places like that. You tend to see the broadleaf a little bit more in lawns. And you can either dig it or enjoy it or kill it. Or a little of both. <laughs> Perfect, yeah. all right, thanks, John. All right, Kyle, not, not a rose by any other name. But... It's the plant of the week, right? Uh, yeah, right. Maybe. Um, <laughs> it's, I, 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 one, one of these days I'll have the plant of the week, but no, so these, this is rose rosette uh, disease. And this sample was actually collected at the Hammond Rose Garden um, at uh, Sunken Gardens in here in Lincoln, which has been experiencing quite the outbreak of, of this disease for anybody who's, who's been down there, and as such, they've had to tear out quite a few, quite a few roses. But as the, so the, um, the name Rose Rosette, it is a virus, but it's also vectored by a urified mite, so a microscopic mite. Has a lot of different symptoms depending on the type of rose that we're actually looking at. And so one of the main symptoms that we will see is kind of a proliferation of thorns that we can see kind of right here. And if this was a normal rose, I would not be able to do this. <laughs> but one of the other things that rose rosette does is it tends to make those newer thorns softer. And so, so this is pretty, pretty textbook for rose rosette. Uh, the, some of the other things that you can see is we'll get some of these, this reddish coloration as well. And here on, the, here on the monster next to me, we almost have one entire cane that is turning it is turning red, but just loads and loads of thorns, um, the proliferation of, flower, of floral parts. Unfortunately, what can you do about this? Nothing. Um, we, can, we can rogue it out and hope that it does not spread. This used to be a disease that was primarily in the southern states, but as we've gotten a little bit warmer, the mite that, um, the, the mite that vectors the virus is able to overwinter in Nebraska a little bit better and we're seeing it more and more often now. 
All right, so rogue those suckers out. Yeah, and hopefully uh, you'd, well, if you're me, you'd be okay with this because it's, it's super cool, I think. <laughs> but if you want a beautiful rose, probably not your cup of tea. All right. Kelly, you do have something pretty. What do you have I, tonight? I do, and I match. My match is you, Kim. <laughs> um, it's National Pollinator Week, so this is a, a butterfly milkweed. So a great plant. We, we know it's for monarch butterflies, but it's a great pollinator plant for all those superstar bees and other pollinators as well, too. So it's, um, it is one of our natives, so milkweeds. And these get about mm, two and a half feet tall. Maybe it, mine's probably even a little bit taller than that. And that bright orange, vivid color, um, you want to plant it where it's going to stay because once they have a deep tap root and they're really hard to move successfully. So, and it's, another thing I like about it is the time of bloom. You know, a lot of our spring blooming things are finished and the summer blooming things are just getting started. So it's a great source um, for the pollinators to forage at this time of year. All right. Excellent. Thanks, Kelly. All right. First picture round. Jody. This comes to us, uh, three pictures on this first one from York. She was concerned that they had termites because they were s removing some siding and, and we found one, two, three things on here. And I think these first three are this one. And then she sent also after these three, so there's that mm -hmm. stuff. And then she sent a week later, she sent another set of pictures, which are something different. So if we look at all five of these kind of in sequence, you came up with something that's yeah. not termites. It's not termites. So that's the great news. Um, and the other news is that these are made by grass carrying wasps. So when the boards or the siding was on the wall, there was some kind of gap and it's a type of uh, like wasp that likes to, to build its cells and nests and voids. So there's, they're also called window wasps. So you may get them in the attractive windows, but you can see those are cocoons. And if there's no holes in them, there actually is a grass carrying wasp uh, developing and they actually provision with tree crickets. They're, that's really fun. And you said that you'll see them carrying little pieces of grass. Oh yeah, you'll see a wasp yeah. carrying like long grass. Right, yeah. excellent, good, no termites. Not excellent. termites. All right, John, your first one comes to us from Sheldon. Um, she, um, oh, sorry, Jody, I forgot you had this one, which is... A lot of aphids. <laughs> Got oleander is, aphids, black is, aphids, and green aphids. Yeah, and this is a mandevilla. Okay. And so he said that he's found all this, and he's wondering exactly how to control all yeah. this. Yeah, so... A, a really strong blast of water will help, but if those leaves are already curling up because of those aphids, because there are so many, try to try to prune some of those off. And they will, depending on what plants they are, they may be able to spread to other ones because you have a variety of aphids there. <laughs> Multiple aphids, all right, thanks. All right, John, now it's your turn. I do this all the time. <laughs> so uh, this comes to us from Sheldon, and she thinks she has never had this weed in her yard before. She, this is the only picture she sent, so we maybe have a couple options here. I think we do have a couple options. Um, the first thing that came to my mind is maple leaf goosefoot, and I think that's just because I like the name. Maple leaf goosefoot grows about a foot tall, easy to pull, so that's a good thing. But it could also be jimson weed, mm -hmm. uh, and you know you hear a lot of these ag commercials for jimson weed, and mm -hmm. and so it's definitely a possibility for that as well. So with a flower that would help, and um, a little bit more definition. But it's one of those two, definitely not something we want. So you could do it, also hoe it if you wanted to get rid of it, but a lot of hand pulling would be pretty easy. All right, thanks, John. Uh, you have two picks on this next one. Uh, this one comes to us from Wahoo, and an amazing explosion of new plants. Uh, she does not remember planting any of these. Is this a flower or a weed? Well, generally we would think of this as a weed, a giant ragweed, and <laughs> it does produce pollen, which causes us problems. The common ragweed does, which looks completely different, mm -hmm. and then this one does too. So probably want to get after this one pretty quick. Right, and if, you, uh, if people think it's goldenrod causing the trouble, it's not. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, John. Kyle, your first one uh, actually came to us last winter, and then uh, she held it because we were off air, mm -hmm. from Denver. And she sent three pictures of this strange stuff. It's jelly-like. It dries up. It comes back. She's tried salt, vinegar, baking soda, Roundup, lye powder, bleach. 
pretty much everything but the kitchen sink, everything that goes in the sink to try to get rid of it. Maybe the kitchen sink would, would help. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is, well, could be, could be a few things. If we were living 600 years ago, we would have said it was remnants of a meteor shower. And so uh, so it's, uh, star jelly. Mm -hmm. um, if we were living 100 years ago, we would say that a, that a vulture vomited up a toad that it did not find palatable. Um, right now, though, it's most likely a slime mold. As to which type of slime mold, it really varies. Um, the one that it most, the one that this one most uh, clearly resembles, is the um, is the brain crystal jelly. Um, and so it's a, a Myxomyces nucleata, is the scientific name. Not a problem. It can sometimes mean that there is an issue with the uh, with the turf, but it's not it's not actively killing the turf. Um, once it dries out, it will go away. Uh, I think she had mentioned she'd have been applying quite a few fungicides. Fungicides aren't going to do a ton for this. It's all about moisture. So decrease the moisture in the lawn and it will probably go away. All right, thanks, Kyle. Uh, two picks on this next one. This comes to us from Shadron, a base of a locust tree. Uh, she said these are relatively hard and they were cone-shaped and they haven't changed much. And, the, and maybe the <coughs> Wicked Witch of the West was underneath mm -hmm. there as well. This is, this is Dead Man's Fingers, uh, Xyleria polymorpha. Um, very common on dead and decaying wood. As the, um, initially, they start off kind of soft, but as they as they mature, they do become pretty hard. All right, and you have one more, and he's just curious about what this beautiful shroom is. Yeah, this is most likely the uh, a golden oyster mushroom or a yellow oyster mushroom, uh, Pleuratus uh, cinciatum. Uh, it's one of our one of our saprobes. Tip, it's not actively killing the tree, but it often means that it can be a sign of a, of a dead or decaying tree. All right, excellent. Thanks, Kyle. Kelly, two picks on the first one. Uh, this is a viewer in Nemaha County. She planted green beans um, May 22nd. They're in a raised bed. The soil is composted cow manure, perlite, vermiculite, ag field soil, beets also failed. Uh, what is she, what do we think is going on here? Okay, well, um, I think I think she was wondering too about herbicide carryover in the soil, and it's you know that's always a possibility. Um, there's really no way to know, but when I look at that soil, it does not look great. I mean, it was very uh, it looks compacted. It, there's crack. It's cracked. There's crusting. Um, so in raised beds, we really like soil. You know, that's very friable, very loose, very well drained. So it could, it could just, it could be that. We, we often don't recommend, if you do use topsoil in a raised bed, we recommend adding a lot of compost, like 70% good topsoil, a sandy loam, something very loose, crumbly, and then add about 30% um, compost to that. And that's what you need in a raised bed. So that could be the issue as well. Um, either, either way, you will solve the problem if you remove that soil and go back in with uh, additional good soil, as I recommended, that 70-30 mix. And the, 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 uh, the necrosis on mm -hmm. the veins actually mm -hmm. does look very similar to ALS herbicide carryover mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. which yep. is pretty common in, right. in soybeans. Right, and that's in any time, if you're getting topsoil, um, you know, ask, ask right. what's been used in this field because um, there, is, there is always that possibility of carryover. All right, thanks. So two picks on this next one. Um, he bought cherry tomatoes that were labeled red. Nope, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any idea which one this is? And he well, wonders whether it'll turn red and or is it still going to be edible? There are black tomatoes. Mm -hmm. And this one, um, I think both Kim and I agree that it probably looks like midnight snack. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, the cult of our midnight snack is, snack is supposed to ripen to red. Mm -hmm. So um, the plant looks healthy. The cherry tomatoes look great. Just let them ripen and, and enjoy them. All right, and one more, and this is a viewer who has these on her spruce. Okay. She, she was a little concerned that they shouldn't be there. What is this? These are the spent uh, male cones that provided the pollen um, to pollinate and fertilize the female cones, and they're just spent. They're kind of loose and crumbly now, and they'll disappear and watch for the female cones to develop and form. All right, perfect. Well, we are starting a new project out at the Backyard Farmer Garden, and we've planted some trees with the purpose of training them to make them flat. It's called espalier, and it's a creative way to make a decorative accent in the landscape or to be a living sculpture.
One of the fun things about the Backyard Farmer Garden is we get to experiment, show you what is possible in the landscape. And if you look at where we are now, we have some little tiny apple trees. We're going to turn this area, which used to be hops, into a spalier. That is a word that basically means let's train plants into a flat plane. It's a very ancient technique. Oftentimes fruit trees are used for it. You don't have to use fruit trees. I've seen witch hazel, I've seen willow, any sort of a tree or, or a shrub that has very flexible branches, especially when they're young. So these started life as bare root trees and they kind of looked a little bit like a bare root apple tree and then we did some major, major, major pruning on these. They have responded by putting on really good growth. To be able to get the pruning done properly though, what we did is we deliberately decided we're going to run our lines of espalier, the flat plane, this direction, we're going to turn the corner, go the other direction, turn the corner. So from a design standpoint, you'll be able to see this beautiful living fence in a flat plane all the way from the bottom of the hill. People espalier for a couple of reasons beyond the pure aesthetics of creating a piece of living art. That would be a very narrow space. You get sunlight on both sides, so if you're actually wanting the fruit, you get fruit if it's a fruit tree. But this is also something that requires a lot of tender loving care, starting again, if possible, with when you put those trees in the ground, being able to do the pruning, select the cuts, so that ultimately you can train them on wires. And that's what will happen. We don't have the wires set yet, but you'll see the wires. Then we will guide those new branches against the wires. We will tie them, we'll clip, we'll prune, we'll continue to do this for the entire life of the espalier up here. This will end up being a really beautiful thing for you to look at. It's possible to do it with a single plant. You don't have to have six, nine, 12, or 15. You can also train them into an X or a vase or a pyramid. So it's kind of up to you and then you have to decide based on the plant whether you're going to pick the right branches for that to start with. It's a little tricky to do this if you get hard wood, so old wood, because it's not nearly as pliable depending on the species. And then you're probably not going to end up with the exact aesthetics that you wanted. So we're going to do this actually as a part of a series because obviously they kind of look like just little old apple trees right now. We'll get the wires up. Come next year, we'll show you again how we've pruned, what we've done, how we've begun to train. Two or three years later, you'll see a beautiful espalier sitting up here where the hops were. This is going to be a fun part of our garden. We will return to show you how it's progressing in further features and somebody else can help us prune. <laughs> All right, Jody, uh, your next set of questions here is three picks on this first one. Uh, these are in Western Oto County. They're good gardeners. Their blackberries have kind of gone downhill. Strong, healthy canes break away. Not all plants are affected. Is this drought? Is this yours? Is this Kyle's? And what do they do? Um, so this kind of looks like Kyle's, but I do want to mention, so I get to talk a little bit, that <laughs> there is a raspberry cane borer that may do damage to blackberries and raspberries, but the symptoms there would be wilting at the tops, and then you would see two rows right below those wilted tops of oviposition scars from the female laying the eggs. But because this is so far down and those canes look really healthy, um, I think there's probably something going on with the roots that I can't even see. So Kyle. Yeah, so I, I actually think it's uh, a crown gall, agrobacterium. Um, there's two different species of bacteria that, that cause this, um, but those kind of warty, irregular galls that we were seeing at the base, very typical of early infections with, with crown gall. I mean, I think she'd also mentioned that they kind of snap off, break away pretty, pretty easily. Right. And that's another thing that we see with crown gall. Not much to do. Um, you'll need to tolerate it. Or if you are going to be re, um, putting any new blackberries in there, look for a resistant cultivar. All right. Thanks, both of you. Jody, you have one pick on this next one. And uh, found it dead. He's just wondering what it is. And he's from up northwest. Okay. Yeah, this was um, an adult uh, elm sawfly. Mm. So we had a lot of sawfly larvae 
eating a lot of different trees, and those larvae would have been feeding on the elm or a willow, and then it fell to the ground, pupated, and um, this is a stingless wasp. All so right, it looks a little like a cow killer, but not quite. <laughs> they are quite big, though. Oh, all right, uh, and one more, and this comes to us uh, from North Bend. A plethora of these yeah. tiny insects on the deck, and thank you for giving us the dime there. What are these and yes. how to get rid of them? So these are sycamore <laughs> seed bugs, and they don't have outbreaks very often, but this, is, uh, this has happened a couple times. And it's, they feed on the sycamore seeds, so there's probably a giant sycamore seed like around, around a sycamore tree. So um, there's not much you can do about it. If you've got everything sealed up, they shouldn't get in the house, but. All right, thanks, Jody. John, two picks on this first one. Uh, this comes to us from Lincoln. And it's a, it's a pretty simple question. How do you, what do you do to get rid of clover in the lawn? Well, first, since it is National Pollinator Week, <laughs> um, you wanna think about how much you do wanna get rid of. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, a large share of people do consider it to be objectionable and it can be overtaking. Um, so you might want to think about that. The first thing you might want to do would be to fertilize the lawn a little bit, and that will thin it and redu reduce the concentration and the spread of it. Um, but also, again, thinning, maybe not with the expectation of complete control. Trimac does work reasonably well, uh, as does Speed Zone. Uh, and this time of application would be about three months from now. This would be late September application. Uh, Kyle and I were talking earlier about any kind of pesticide application at this time of year when you're in 90, low 90s, even in the upper 90s, may not be a good idea just from the solvents and, and other ingredients that are in it. Yeah, you can see a lot of phytotoxicity. Yeah. Right, all right, so enjoy it, mow it, and right. wait. Yeah. yeah. All right, uh, one picture on this next one. Uh, this is a Bellevue viewer, and they wonder what this plant is that is growing in their garden. Well, this is a little bit past the full flower stage, so we had to do a little bit of guessing here. Probably buttercup. Um, there is a um, celery-leafed buttercup that could be this. Um, but regardless, um, it can be a, a tad bit um, invasive. So if you've got a lot of it, start pulling. Um, if you've got a tremendous amount of it, any of the three-way herbicides are going to work, but probably just a good hand pulling on a Saturday morning. All right, thanks, John. Okay, Kyle, two picks. Uh, this is 12 miles north of Mullen in the Sand Hills. The garden's in the open. This rhubarb plant, the others are fine, and she has three different kinds of rhubarb, and, and she, uh, she's been a viewer for decades, but she's a little concerned about this one. Yeah, um, it, if it was earlier in the year, I would say this is kind of spot on cold damage. That's when we get red on rhubarb, but Right, I think that this is maybe a combination. So a rhubarb can get a rust that often turns the red, turns turns the leaves kind of red like this. But there's also some leaf spots in there that are kind of pale yellow or um, or pale white, and that's most likely um, caused by a, a ramularia leaf spot. And so it's very common on very common on rhubarb. Often has kind of a reddish tint to it. Um, any any one of your your general garden herbis, um, fungicide should work. Um, copper products, something with chlorothalonil would also work as well. All right, thank you. Uh, two pictures on this one also. This is a Central City viewer. She has pole beans looking like this. Only some are affected, others are fine. Is this viral, is this herbicide, is this both? It is probably growth regulator herbicide injury. Um, and with only a few of them being affected, I would guess that the application was a little ways away. And when we get drift, drift occurring, wherever that, those particles land, those are the plants that are affected. So I would keep an eye on these. If it should, I think it would, will grow out of it. it. May take two to three weeks, but it, will, it should grow out of it. If you're still seeing these symptoms after about three weeks, then it's probably a virus and you'll just need to get rid of it. All right, thanks, Kyle. Kelly, two pictures on this first one. Uh, this comes to us from Pleasanton. She has two to three foot blue spruce and a daylily. And the daylily is looking like that, and the <laughs> spruces are looking like this. They're next to Austrian pines. They, 
they do this. She says they've kind of been doing this beautiful yellow thing. So mm -hmm. what do we think is going on here? Well, I'll take her word for it that it's beautiful and yellow because when I first saw it, it appeared to be very white and almost bleached. And I thought, could that be mesotrione? But if it's been doing it a number of years and it's very uniform um, and it's a pretty yellow, it's a, in, you know, in, in, other than in the picture, it's a nice pretty yellow, then that usually on, that indicates a red issue. So you just have to do a little bit of CSI investigation. You know, is the soil really wet? Is the soil really dry? Is it was it planted too deep, a girdling issue? Um, but it's, and, you know, same thing, the, the daylily one kind of confuses me a little bit because they're a pretty tough plant and to be that yellow. Um, but the only, I, I zoomed in on it. It doesn't look like chlorosis, which we rarely see in, in daylily, but I think some type of a root issue. So check it out. Um, the spruce, you know, they, if they've been doing this for a few years, they're probably never going to thrive there. So, and spruce are over overplanted already. So you might want to check into uh, replacing any that die uh, with something different. All right, thanks, Kelly. Three pictures on this next one. Uh, this is an Omaha viewer. Three PJM rhododendrons in a raised west-facing bed. Chlorosis. She's wondering how they treat this, and she did say that they, uh, per, you know, they moved into this house. Mm -hmm. established over seven years. So what do we think here? Well, I mean, they are chlorotic because they're the classic uh, yellowish light green and the veins are a darker green. So it is a chlorosis. Um, again, it's kind of a, it's a really tough site to grow rhododendron. And if, if it's been causing, having this problem for a while, yes, you can try to treat it. It's usually a high pH soil or kind of a root, you know, just stressed roots and they're just not able to effectively take up the iron that's there in the soil. Or I don't know, maybe it's manganese too, because on manganese on maples often. So they could try, I mean, you can do, I mean, you can do a liquid treatment of, but it, and it'll green it up. Um, if it doesn't burn it, you have to be extremely careful, um, but it won't last very long. Um, you could try to do a soil treatment with ferrous sulfate, but chances are it's going to be an ongoing chronic problem that they're going to have to battle. And that's just a really tough site to grow those rhododendrons. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Well, it is time to take a few minutes to see what's happening out at our garden. We're trying some new things, and we have two we'd like to focus on tonight. Here's Terry James at the Backyard Farmer Garden to tell us more. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're going to start looking at some of the plants that we have growing in our 2023 garden. Two of the plants that we're going to start looking at are both vines, so we're going to have to be trellising both of these up throughout the summer. The first one is one that we've grown before, and it's called Cucamelon or Mexican Sour Gherkins or mouse melons. These are a fun plant to be planting, especially if you have kiddos around. They're about the size of a large grape, but they are cucumbers and they look like tiny little watermelons and they're very fun to eat right off the vine, very crunchy, and you can even pickle them for the winter and serve them at your holiday table to remember your summer garden. The other one that we're gonna talk about, we have never grown here and it is one that's normally grown in the tropics and that's jicama. This is one that you eat the root and it's uh, very crunchy, almost like an apple. Uh, you can either cook it or eat it raw. I've had it raw and I would prefer it that way. Um, but this is gonna be a vine. We're gonna have to kind of figure out how to manage it. We're gonna have to cut it back a little bit, make sure it doesn't go to flower and make sure that it's getting a big root. This one we had to start in our greenhouse early too. So back like in February is when we actually had to start this and get it up and growing before we transplanted it out into our garden. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check out the plants that we're growing for 2023. And right now it is of course time for lightning. All right, Kelly, okay. you ready? I'm ready. This is a Lincoln viewer with a big pin oak that is yellowing right now. And they wonder, is it okay to treat it now? Can they do it or should a professional do it? I, I would have a professional do it. Um, it, I, it seems on pin oak you could do it now, but spring is better. All right. We have a Northern Nebraska viewer who is asking, what do elderberries need to be healthy? Every full sun, good soil. All those good things. Moisture. All right. Uh, we have a York viewer who wants to know 
how you know when to dig garlic and how you know when to replant it. Okay, I, I think it's by size. That's one thing I've never grown, so I think it's just mainly by size, I'm going to say. I hope that's right. All right. And um, plant in the fall. <laughs> plant in the fall. We have a viewer who had a branch that broke and they taped it back together and then another branch fell on it, will that survive or should they cut their losses? No. Prune it off. All right. Uh, should a deep root waterer be used for birch? And if so, how deep? Um, I wouldn't use a deep root watering where you stick it in and try to water. I would just sprinkle on top and moisten the soil about eight to 10 inches. All right, 10 inches. Excellent, nice job. Okay, Kyle, you ready? Born ready. <laughs> or not. Or not, yeah, it doesn't really <laughs> matter, does it? Okay, your first one comes to us from Hardington, and it could have been uh, from many other people. The question is whether those little bitty shrooms that appear after a rain in the lawn will spread indefinitely and take over the lawn. Uh, only if there's a whole bunch of dead and decaying wood material under in your lawn. All right. Uh, we have a viewer who has a 30-year-old tree that has mushrooms appearing at the base of the tree. Is that tree done for? Most likely. It's it's not long for this world, yep. All right, we have a broken bow viewer who says uh, his hackberries are beginning to lose all their leaves. Is there some sort of a virus affecting hackberries right now? Uh, no viruses, there are some fungi, but it's dry. All right, uh, we have a, another viewer who has a soil that was diagnosed with Phytophthora in it. What, what can you do with the soil itself? Um, you can sterilize it, or you would just find a phytophthora-resistant cultivar of, or of whatever you want to plant. All right, and we have a Milford viewer who says, what are the black spots on the bottom of tomatoes? Uh, blossom end rot, calcium deficiency. All right, nice job. Okay, John, your very first lightning round. Here we go. <laughs> All right, are you ready? Mm -hmm. So this is a Bennett viewer who has buffalo burr and buffalo grass. Can you use quinclorac on it? That's a great question, don't know. All right, you get to pass, by the way. Pass. All right, uh, we have a Council Bluffs viewer who wonders whether 2,4-D will still volati volatilize after it dries. Usually not, and a lot of that depends whether it's an amine or an ester formulation. But after you get a thorough drying, usually it's pretty much done. Okay, we have a drought-stricken turf and it's hardly growing. Should they mow it anyway? You know, you really want to restrict that because you can compact the soil. If you're not getting much, if you're not needing to take much off, then you could just lengthen out the time between mowings. All right. Is there a selective herbicide for a Kentucky blue or cool season grasses in the warm season grasses? There is, but it's very tricky. And you have to wait till it frosts uh, two or three times before you come back across the top of it. So it's kind of tricky. I know of someone who was tricked by that. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody who happens to be sitting in a chair here? No, no, no but someone who could have, who a former university employee, yes. <laughs> All right, thanks, John, nice job. Excuse me, all right, you ready? Yep. First one is the dreaded clover mite control. Where do they come from and how do you control them? Well, it's very difficult because I think that they are overwintering on the structure itself. So the best thing to do is vacuum them up when they get in under the window sills and put out glue boards right by where they're coming in to get them before they get into the rest of the house. Glue boards, all glue right. Boards. This is a New Jersey viewer who found two lantern flies in their garden and they're wondering what we know about controlling lantern flies. Well, luckily we don't have them here, but I would contact their local um, NDA or whatever they have there, Department of Ag, because they're probably on the lookout for those if they are not already been reported in those counties. All right, uh, how do you control fungus gnats indoors? Oh, well that means you have an overwatered plant, so stop watering. All right, uh, we have somebody who is wondering whether emerald ash borer is still prevalent in our part of the state. Yes, it has not gone away. And if you have an ash tree, you need to think about treating it if you want to keep it. All, All right. the people that had ash saw fly, think about your ash tree. All right, awesome. Excellent job, all. Okay, Kelly, plants of the week. Okay, plants of the week. We've got a white one, a purple one, and a yellow one. And the white one is vervain. Um, kind of a spike flower, very pretty. And this one likes full sun. It's drought tolerant, it likes dry conditions. It's kind of an upright growing plant. 
The purple one is Larkspur, Royal Ensign Larkspur. And very, very pretty. That's an annual and it'll recede itself, so it sometimes kind of acts like a perennial, but it's actually an annual receding when they come back. And they like sun and they'll tolerate part shade. And the yellow one is dill. So kind of a ferny one, uh, adds some little bit different texture, and it's fern leaf dill. Very pretty. Besides which, it smells really good. Mm. Yes. <laughs> All right, thanks, Kelly. All right, next uh, round of pictures. Let's see, Jody, you have two for this first one. Uh, this is an Omaha viewer, light brown discoloring on the tips of their evergreen shrub. And she, she sent a couple there that, that show the kind of the tip ends on this one. Do we have any ideas on this? Um, it could be heat damage. It could also be, I mean, it could be a, a moth that may be boring into the tip, but you'd have to actually go and check that out, look for some webbing or look for some holes near the base of the new growth. So that could be something yeah, that could some, head to extension. Right, more information, please. All right, uh, one pick from this next one. This is from Byron, Nebraska. Four foot Colorado blue spruce, the new growth dies back each year after spraying with a labeled fungicide during early spring growth. What's the issue there and how do we eliminate? Um, is that insect or what do we think I there? mean, I don't know if, Kyle, is there like a I, problem with fungicide? I would want to know what, what fungicide is being applied. <laughs> um, if it's never a good idea, unless he's treating for something not a good idea just to do a, a, um, a regular fungicide ap application. With some of the hot weather that we've been having, a lot of our sulfur and, and, and copper fungicides are um, leading to some, some extra phytotoxicity as well. So it could be a few things. Um, reach out to your local extension office. All right, thanks. Uh, one on the next one, Jody. This is a well-established dwarf Alberta spruce, eight feet tall. Noticed all these rust spots. Um, they are in Lincoln, it gets mostly sun. Yes, this is likely spider mites. And if you wanna know if they are still active, you can put a white little like index card or piece of paper and tap the branches to see if they fall out. Um, a lot of this damage may have been done in the earlier spring or last fall. I don't know much about trees, but I've heard that this one might have some problems and you may want to replace it with something else. <laughs> In other words, the entire panel says we don't like this tree. <laughs> All right, one more. And this one comes to us from Yankton, South Dakota. Uh, he is wondering, what is this white worm found it by the roots of a young cherry tree? Yeah, so this is one of the white grubs. So it's one, it turns into a scarab beetle. Uh, at this time of year, it might be a three-year grub. So if it's at the base of the cherry tree, just uh, feed that to the birds. All right, perfect. All right, John, you have three pictures on this first one. This is a Grand Island viewer. Um, she's got this vine and then it's taking over the flower bed. She's wondering if she can spray with a herbicide. Then she's got this one and she's got that one yeah. all in the same bed. You know, this is Virginia creeper. Uh, at least the first few photos were. Um, and then this latter one is a mix of various things, including poison ivy. So the first ones, you can, you can spray with a herbicide, but I would recommend just pruning it, and pulling it and pruning it. I have the same issue. And I just take about 10 minutes and pull it out and dispose of it, so it's not a big issue. Um, but see, the, you can see the five foliate or the pent foliate leaf. That's the first distinction between the Virginia creeper and then what you see in the next photo, which is going to be a mix of trifoliate or three foliate leaves, which is the poison ivy, uh, over on top and underneath of the Virginia creeper. When you've got this kind of uh, situation, it just really calls for eradication. And there are some uh, common herbicides you can buy at the hardware store containing triclop here. But I wouldn't mess around with trying to be very selective here. And if you are one of the type of folks who are sensitive, I had a fellow that I worked with who would get within 50 feet of it and he would, his eyes would swell and his nose would run and he'd be puffy and he'd miss the day of work. Uh, and then other people hardly get any reaction to it. So um, at the very least, nitrile gloves and be very careful about how you spray it. But it, it's, you're not gonna be able to just pull certain plants out and leave others behind. All right, one picture on this next one. This comes to us from Hastings. Uh, what is this grass? Well, I think part of this has to do with a recent overseeding and whenever that happens, 
you're going to get a few contaminants. Uh, it, it just happens. And uh, from if you look real close at the cut ends, um, they're really rough. And that would indicate a plant with strong vascular bundles on the inside, um, kind of like celery. Um, so it's probably a coarse fescue, but it's really hard to tell unless it flowers. All right, thanks, John. And one more, and this is a Lex viewer. What is this weedy grass and how do they get rid of it? Well, fortunately, we do have the seed head on this one and it's a foxtail, uh, probably yellow foxtail. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit big for a post-emergence, but you could try quinclorac on this and hope to get some control, but don't have high expectations. Pre-emergence applications in the spring. All right, thanks, John. Kyle, uh, we're a little behind, so you get to hurry. All right. The first one here is, this is uh, a tree in her daughter's yard. It's a maple, several branches are affected. What is the deal? I would, I would follow those branches back and look for some sort of injury or canker. Um, if, we, if that was across the entire tree, we would say it was chlorosis, but right now there's something inhibiting moisture getting there, it's affecting the, um, the chlorophyll. So look for, look, for the, uh, look for a canker back and probably prune it out. All right, your second one comes to us from Phillipsburg, Kansas. Roses are looking like this. Probably black spot of rose, uh, Diplocaron uh, rosier. It's pretty common fun, uh, fun, fungus that we get on a lot of our older variety, uh, older rose varieties. Most of our common fungicides will take care of it. All right, one pick on this one, and this is uh, a spruce that's got those dead needles in the interior. Any ideas on this one? Um, not. It, could be, if it was lower, I would say that we're probably looking at um, Rhizosphera or Stigmina. With it kind of being across the, um, throughout the entire tree, I would wonder if there isn't some sort of root issue that's kind of inhibiting um, moisture there too. All right, and one more, and this is a big blue spruce, and then she found little cankers on the branches when she was checking for bagworms. What yeah. can she do about this? Prune them out. Uh, that white pitch is often associated with Cytospora canker. All right, just prune them out. All right, Kelly, two pictures for you. This first one is a dwarf cherry. In Blair, five to six years old, it's been very healthy, and then it's looked like this. She, she did discover that her husband has been using Tordon. <laughs> you want to talk about Tordon? Yep, you have to be very, very <laughs> careful with Tordon, and it does when you look, zoom in and you look really close. The petioles are kind of curled, so it probably most likely was the Tordon. Uh, there are some Tordons that are labeled for use in lawns, but we really hesitate recommending them if there's a tree anywhere in your yard or your neighbor's yards, you are at risk of damaging those trees. So use extreme care. All right. And don't use, we just recommend not using Tordon in landscape situations. All right, three pictures on this one. This is also a cherry. This is a weeping cherry, two years old. This is at Lake Wakanda. Uh, thriving first year and then all of a sudden it started doing this. She's wondering if she do anything to get this tree to come back to being a beautiful thing. I don't, I don't think so. These are, these are trees, they're, kind, they're fun, they're interesting. We see them in, in the garden centers and they kind of have a lot of curb appeal, so we'll purchase them. But a lot of these tend to die. Either uh, they're not fully hardy or that graph fails. So there's no bringing it back. All right, thanks Kelly. Well, 13 years ago, we started a renovation project in the courtyard of Kime Hall here on East Campus. For many years, it was a turf area with a featured pond and young trees. Of course, those trees have grown, the turf has declined. For our second feature tonight, Rock is going to talk about renovating that turf and give us some options. We're sitting in the courtyard at Kime Hall, which is adjacent to Plant Science Hall on the east campus of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. This area has a really rich history of being just basically boring and turf to when it was initially installed with a great water display and a lot of plant material to where we are now where it's a mature landscape with lots of trees and lots of maintenance that's required and a lot of species that we can't see. This is definitely a living laboratory that we use for a lot of our horticultural and turf grass science classes. But it's gotten to the point now where we've increased the shade and it's a little bit of a hostile environment to begin with so it's time to renovate the turf grass area that I'm standing on. But the question is do we go with what we initially started with, which lent itself to the more open, you know, not full sun, but some shade. We originally had turf type tall fescue in here. 
we sodded it with the well-known RTF variety, right? So that was a great idea in its time. But as this area has matured, we have an option to maybe think about another turf grass species. So this is gonna be the first in a series of videos where we're gonna show you how we renovate it. But let's start with doing your homework before you get on the ground and start digging things up, right? So let's think about what we want here. Now we know turf type tall fescue grew here, but it's a lot shadier. We know we can't grow buffalo grass or definitely not berberita grass. Kentucky bluegrass also isn't very shade tolerant. So do we have an option to try the true fine leaf fescues? Creeping red fescue, red fescue, sheep fescue, hard fescue. These are all fescues, but not turf type tall fescue. And they're very thin bladed. Um, they can spread a little bit depending upon which species you choose. And that may be the direction we end up going, but we still haven't fully thought about that. The other option is, is we certainly could put in maybe a shade tolerant wildflower mix, but then we have to think about the use patterns of this area, right? Students come in here, they like to sit. We've got internet access in here. They can get on the wireless. Um, also, when we show it, we have a walk around and there needs to be a central gathering place. So I think we're gonna stick with turf and we're probably gonna go with a, with a turf type fine fescue like we just described. So stay tuned. I think you're going to see some amazing things happen when we get ready for that planting weather for the cool season grasses in the in the fall. I think you're going to learn some great tips for establishing not only fine fescue, but also any other cool season grass you'll be thinking about doing to renovate these lost spaces. And we will hear from Rock later in the season about what we ultimately decided to plant and how we did it. You know, we have numerous videos on just about everything that has to do with turf on the Backyard Farmer YouTube channel. It's really a great resource for you to learn how to grow your plants the right way, see what's current in the horticultural world, or to learn about insect or disease or pest control. Check it out after the show. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. All right, we have one announcement, and this is a fun one. This is uh, Daylily Days, which is July 5th to July 22nd at Harmony Nursery and Daylily Farm in Bradshaw. And uh, pretty spectacular in bloom when they are flowering. Okay, Jody, uh, four questions, four pictures, four fun ones. The first is from Hastings. No question, just this cool bug. What is it? This cool bug is the candy striped leaf hopper. Candy stripe, I love it. Okay, then we have a Western Oto County uh, viewer who found this and came across this one. What is this one? Yeah, this is a newly, I guess, a, a first day of adulthood. Uh, a small milkweed bug. Milkweed bug. Yeah, so that's why it kind of looks that way. It'll redden and blacken. It'll, it'll get bright. It'll lose the blue. Yes. Gotcha. All right, uh, another one, and he, he was in the garden weeding and thought this lady, presumably, was lurking. She's wondering, were these her young or her eggs on the back? What kind of a spider is this, and is uh, he right? Kind of. This is like, this is a, a mama wolf spider. Mm -hmm. And these are spiderlings. So she carried her egg sac for uh, quite some time, and now she carries her spiderlings for about two weeks. Oh, that's fun. I hate them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and your final one here is found this uh, caterpillar parade. It was in a ball, and then it stretched out and headed across the This the is lawn. so cool, and this is my dream to see this actually happen in real life. These are actually dark-winged fungus gnats in a larval procession. I don't know where they're going. I don't know why they do that, but they come together and predators don't attack them because they look like a giant snake. Oh, for heaven's <laughs> sakes. Yes. That's fun. All right, thanks. John, uh, one picture and one question, and this is um, Spurge hiding in there somewhere, and the flat leafy one, will it regrow? And this looks more like a wild barley picture. I think you're right. But uh, <laughs> let's, ans let's answer the... Uh, Let's answer the first one, yeah. The spurge. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with spurge, um, there's prostrate spurge, there's spotted spurge, and if they're mixed together, it's no big deal, but it's kind of fun to look at the two different ones. Pulling and hoeing is really, at this time of the year, probably one of your better ways to go. And then mulching across the top of it is a good thing. Um, you can use Carpenterzone, triclopyr, but really the key is uh, pre-emergence in the spring. All right, and it, that one is a beast. Yeah. And we also have, um, we have a picture from Yankton, South Dakota, and this one is some yellow flowered vine spreading rapidly in the buffalo grass lawn. What is it and how to control it? And it's not really a vine. 
Well, as I looked closer, I think this is the spurge. I think that's the spurge, and oh. that's the hackberry. So and we're a little out of order. A little bit, but that's okay. Yeah. Um, the hackberry sprouts we see these with um, with elm. We see these with um, honey locust, uh, mulberry. Very common with mulberry, mm -hmm. especially in fence rows. Mm -hmm. And so the key is to snip out the tap root as best you can, and then uh, give it a fine spray of. Um, woody brush killer and you'll see these in hardware stores everyone seems to have their own brand but the common active ingredient is triclopyr and it may take a couple of applications and eventually it'll sort of run out of energy okay so mowing and mowing and mowing may work or not maybe you need a little bit more intervention in addition to the mowing right, right. intervention being the right word yeah okay thanks John all right uh, Kyle we have uh, first off one picture here, this comes to us from, not quite sure, oh, Norfolk, peony, and the leaves are yellowed, they've stopped growing. Handful of people with the same question on this one. Uh, looks like a virus um, is affecting the entire plant. Not really nothing, can't spray anything on it. Um, if it is, it might be tobacco rattle virus, which is actually vectored by a microscopic worm in the soil, which is pretty cool. Um, Nothing to really do about it. If you don't like it, some people do like it. <laughs> Most people don't. Um, but if you don't like it, it'll be um, rogue it out. Completely. Yep, comple and make sure yeah, you're, you want to get all that root material as well. All right. Uh, your second one comes to us from Omaha. This is also a peony. Uh, this one's yellow. Uh, yellowish leaves. And then another one has all this white spots on it. So we've got one that's yellowish and we've got another one that has the white stuff. She is thinking this is powdery mildew. Then she is correct. Um, it's powdery mildew time of year. You can decrease water, maybe do some selective pruning in there to increase airflow through it. And the yellowish one, nutrition? It's probably nutrition, some sort of root issue. Um, yeah. One or the other. One or the other, yeah. All right, then we have two picks on this next one. And uh, this was in a raised planter or in a planter. He wonders what this shroom is. Yeah, so, well, I don't entirely know. The first one, pretty obvious. It's uh, one of our Leucococoprinus um, mushrooms, very common in, in potting soil. And we actually see it a lot in, in house plants. I've never seen a Leucococoprinus open up that. like this though. And so maybe it's like a Gormagon type head if anyone watched Stranger Things. Um, but I would love to actually get this sample if you're able to bring it to Lincoln. All right, thanks Kyle. All right, Kelly, uh, we have about a minute and a half and your first one is a Silver Ray Korean Pine in York. It was hit by golf ball sized hail. Uh, new growth on the west seems to be growing. The other um, it, side is not. Is this a hail reaction potentially? And what should she do? It, it definitely could be a hail reaction. I mean, it's, it's kind of tough to see if, you know, it looks like it's yellow, yellowish on one side, damaged on one side. Um, if they, she's lost the central leader, then maybe select a, one that's kind of li limber <laughs> and, and stake it up. You know, so it'll take over dominance. All right, thanks. Uh, one picture on this next one, and this is a viewer who has this garden area. She has tried for years to control the weeds in it because she does want to garden here. Any ideas? Well, you have to you have to hoe, you have to hand pick, you have to get rid of what's there. You could probably use a preen for gardens um, once you get rid of all the weeds, and then mulch to shade out the weed seed. All right, and two pictures quickly on this next one. This is a butterfly's magnolia that was in the ground. Uh, no deer, but it is creature damage. What should she do? Uh, there's, there's not much you can do, but protect it if possible. It was a pretty large plant, if I remember right, so I don't know if you can exclude them anymore, but um, yeah, maybe hang some soap in it in case it's deer. Yeah, or anything else and just don't wrap or paint that wound or yes, anything. Yes, yep, leave the wound alone.